Welcome to the Software Lifecycle Stories podcast. We bring you stories of what worked and sometimes what did not in the course of discovering, designing, developing, delivering and using software-based solutions as shared by practitioners who went through these situations. Welcome to this episode of Software Lifecycle Stories. Today with me is J. Veera Raghavan, known as J.B., who is the co-founder of PM Power Consulting. J.B. has been in the IT industry for close to four decades and has played various roles. And in this conversation, we cover a whole range of topics, including product engineering, the future of automated software development, Agile, and a lot of other topics. Listen on. Hi, JV. Welcome to the show. As you know, we've been uh, talking to different practitioners who've been there, done that, who've been involved in right from conception to actual delivery and consumption of software-based solutions. So very happy to have you as a guest. And like with uh, all the guests, I would uh, like to start with you introducing yourself first. Thanks, Shep. Uh, it's it's been a great opportunity to to feature in this podcast. Uh, introducing myself, uh, yeah, maybe I would probably begin uh, with uh, my my background first. Uh, I would say I come from a very traditional Orthodox family, uh, and I probably continue to you know uh, live a traditional Orthodox lifestyle to this day. Uh, my schooling, uh, pre-university education was uh, in Madurai. Uh, then, of course, uh, I went to IIT Madras for my graduation and post-graduation. I uh, was very lucky to, to actually you know, uh, get an offer from Tata Burroughs while uh, doing my post-graduation at IIT Madras. And that's how you know, my career in software development actually began. Uh, I obviously never expected to be involved in uh, software when I was at IIT because I, my graduation was in mechanical engineering. Uh, my MTech was in industrial management. So I was actually hoping to get into some uh, management job, but uh, bro, uh, got an opportunity from Tata Bros. And, and today, if I look back, uh, that probably was a, a great foundation for me. And uh, in some sense, I've been lucky to work with only three companies uh, all my uh, career, uh, 14 years with the Tatas, Tata Bros. and then Tata Unisys. 10 years with uh, Novell, Novell Software Development in India. And then the last uh, 12 years, uh, 13 years r- roughly, I've been with uh, PM Power. I mean, starting PM Power in 2006, beginning and you know, continuing to this day. So it's, it's a bit of a rarity uh, these days that you, know, you work for 35 plus years and yet you know, end up working with just three companies. But uh, all the same, uh, I would say that I've had uh, the fortune of uh, uh, a Tremendous experience, rich experience all these years in the sense that uh, when I look at software lifecycle, product lifecycle, I've actually been very fortunate to have been involved uh, in, in all aspects of software development uh, or, or, or management, uh, starting from you know, being a developer when I joined Tata's uh, to doing you know, uh, design development, you know, project management. I was involved with product engineering with, uh, with uh, TUL uh, in one of their financial products, financial uh, services products. And then uh, I was also involved with uh, some product development for Unisys uh, towards the end of my career in Tata Unisys. And then uh, you know, work for a technology company, understood the technology, and you know, I always wanted to be involved in a, a small technology kind of uh, setup where I would learn a lot more. Uh, so in that sense, I learned a lot with Novell. Uh, being involved with product development uh, was exciting. And, and learning a lot about product engineering. I also did some teaching at IIM Bangalore when I left Nobel. Uh, so I had an opportunity to teach, to teach uh, really high quality students at IIM and teach something that I enjoyed doing. I mean, two areas that I've enjoyed working with all these uh, years, uh, software metrics and product engineering. And I had the fortune of actually teaching both these subjects as electives for the PG SEM program at, at IIM Bangalore. And then uh, through the last 12 years, it's been fun working with uh, uh, PM Power with uh, 
dozens of clients. I mean, you know, many, many, many clients, and you know, looking at uh, each one of them in a unique way, and you know, learning along the way. So I would say 35 years of uh, experience involved in you know, involving virtually every aspect of uh, the software lifecycle, including quality assurance and processes, uh, which I was associated with in both in Tata Unisys and in Novell. Uh, so you know, setting up a product testing lab in Novell was a was a big challenge, and being you know, able to test very large products, uh, all kinds of testing, non-functional testing, reliability testing, stress testing, scalability testing. So very rich experience in Novell, and now uh, a lot of experience with uh, agile transformation with companies uh, end-to-end, you know, especially large corporates, uh, you know, looking at challenges there, and being involved with teams again. I've always enjoyed working with people, so uh, and working with teams, and, and seeing them succeed. Uh, it's it's been something that that I've enjoyed. You know, when people succeed with uh, what you are trying to do and help them with, uh, you always have a great sense of satisfaction. That's something that I've enjoyed doing, and, and I've been fortunate to have gone through this and and, and uh, learned along the way and contributed along the way. That that's some brief introduction. Maybe you know we can take it from you know you, what you have in mind in terms of what you would like me to share. Oh, thanks, Jv. That was a very beautiful and crisp introduction. Uh, one thing that um, I know you have also done very early in your career also is to working on you know, 4GLs. Okay. Today, people still talk about you know, no code, low code and all that. And you've been both on the development side and like you said, on the, the quality side as well as you know, the leadership trying to plan, trying to be predictable, trying to have good quality and all that. Mm -hmm. So are there some patterns that you see? or uh, Did you get any new perspectives when you moved from, say, on the developer role to a quality assurance or a quality control role? I I would say that, uh, you know, one of the things that, that made me succeed in the quality assurance, uh, the process side of the, the, the quality side, if you look at it. One of the reasons I was able to succeed, in my opinion, was the fact that uh, I had the experience of actually working with uh, software development and design and you know, doing project management, going through the, the, hard, uh, you know, the hard grind of actually you know, working with customers and delivering something for customers, and also working with products and, and, and the engineering of products. So. I think when you get into quality assurance with that hands-on experience, uh, it's always very useful. And I think I would say, when I was working at Novell, this was uh, you know, people who were working that I was peer to were you know, these are top technocrats from from some of the best companies in India, and then they were they were probably very very highly respected. And generally, you find uh, you know uh, in a startup kind of environment that we had in Novell when we started. Uh, the culture is such that you know when you look at process and you tell them quality assurance and process and you know, let's say code reviews and things like that, some of these don't necessarily go down well with people. So they they actually say, why do we need to do it? I'm I'm sure it will work. You know, I can actually do it, my own testing and make sure everything works. So all these processes are a lot of overhead and you know, we don't need it. So in in that kind of an environment, to actually help them understand the value behind it and you know why you need to do certain things. I think if you had the experience of doing it before, uh, you get respected. And, and if I really look back, that experience was something that you know, helped me tremendously in my first five or six years at Novell, where uh, people were uh, you know, really, really, you know, uh, uh, if I look at the, the, the quality of people, uh, they're, they're very intellectually, you know, uh, very good, uh, very brilliant people. Those kinds of people are usually, uh, you know, they, they may take time to get convinced about something that's that's good for you know, software development, product development in terms of process. But once they're convinced, they, they go all the way to do it. And if I look back, success there was something that that inspired me to you know, look at that as a, as a role that, that I enjoyed doing. So in some sense, I think uh, having that experience with software development helped me, I would say. Uh, um, yeah, related to that, I see as a developer, Say you are more in a problem solving mode, mm -hmm. but when you have to do the quality assurance, are you able to get into still that kind of thinking as a developer, or does it become more of a fault finding mode? 
No, in fact, I think you you probably need to think uh, like the developer and, and appreciate the challenges because see the way I look at uh, if I look at this role, uh, quality assurance role, or for that matter, what role we are playing today with uh, consulting for organizations and let's say the agile journey or so on. Uh, typically, are playing a, a, an advisory consulting kind of role, you know, a staff role in many ways. And and if I look back, uh, other than the first. Five or six years of my career uh, with Tata's, the last almost 25 to 30 years has actually been uh, more in a staff capacity, advisory capacity, where you are influencing uh, teams and influencing the leadership team to actually adopt something that will be, you know, for the benefit of the organization, their own benefit or the project benefit. So, uh, I would say that it's a you know tougher challenge, but the only way you can actually uh, make a success of that is if you get into the shoes of the developer and appreciate what they're going through and, and listen to them, understand the challenges and, 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 and contextualize your, your solution. For example, you know, there is no, you know, you don't go by the book and say, you know, do this, do this, do this. You actually try to find out and, and you know, if they have a need for an exception, if they say that in, in some circumstances, let's say a combination of code reviews and unit testing, but not necessarily 100% code review, for example is what is needed, you know, understand, and then you, you're able to actually recommend what is right in that environment rather than, you know, go by the, the book. And, and typically, when you look at a lot of the process folks who don't have the, the actual development background, they tend to go by the letter of what needs to be done rather than, you know, get into the spirit and understand how to actually, you know, customize or tailor it to a specific project or an environment or a need. Mm, that's nice. So I guess, yeah, before I ask a question on uh, you know, the whole adaptability and agility, uh, one thing is, is there anything on the reverse side? I mean, how can developers understand a tester's mind? I, I, th I think the, the way they need to look at it is, you know, when they go through it, if they are not able to find something and, and a tester actually finds something, that means that, they, you know, the tester is adding some value. You, you actually you know, make them understand that uh, if, if you are doing it and you know, if a tester is not able to find something, they have done a fantastic job. And, you know, uh, but, but very often you find that uh, the tester is actually adding value. And, and the reason he adds value is because he comes from a different perspective. Or more often than not, uh, you know, even though you know, we used to call it, I mean, especially when, we, when I did it in Novel, we used to say, you know, a tester's mind is destructive and and a developer's mind is constructive. And those, those kinds of constructs are all gone now where we actually see a fusion of these two roles in the, you know, the agile environment where we actually tell people that it's not that one person does developer and one person does testing and, and, you know, uh, and, and both think differently. It's actually, you need to have both mindsets so that you can ensure that you know, you're able to do it right the first time. So anyway, coming back, uh, I think your question about how can they understand, I think if they see that tester is adding value, uh, you know, because they are not able to find something when the tester is able to find it. I, I think they need to, you know, respect that and they will start respecting it. And I think it's, it, the respect is yearned. I mean, I, I found it when I was heading product testing in Novell, you know, we all had to yearn the respect of the development team because the development teams are pretty good, pretty strong. So if they had to respect the testing team, unless you start contributing and, you know, getting, uh, you know, make, making them see value from you, uh, though it's it's very difficult for them to accept it, and once that acceptance happens, then the collaboration is so much better. So, if I may paraphrase, so mm -hmm. a couple of things that you mentioned. One is that uh, the distinction between the constructor and the destructor is all vanishing. You said, which means mm -hmm. that the multi-skilling or thinking about mm -hmm. what will happen next also are all characteristics that we hear that agile teams would be good at. So in your experience of coaching teams that were say following other practices earlier and then moving to agile, mm -hmm. have you seen these kinds of behavior changes actually happening? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I think uh, I've actually had the experience of working with a you know, large financial services uh, company in an agile transformation uh, journey, their tra transformation journey, though, you know, they were not in a program where uh, they were doing a large scale, you know, uh, you know, trading platform, trading system. Uh, 
basically, the, the dev and the QA teams were actually not seeing eye to eye in the beginning. I mean, you know, they had their own issues, challenges. Uh, there was always this question about, you know, when will I get the product delivered to testing? You know, typically, when you work in a three-week cycle, the, the way they were working is, uh, you know, typically the first two, two and a half weeks will be developed and the last few days will be testing. And, and most stories will actually get delivered towards the last few days. And, and then, uh, you know, they, when they find some issue, they will throw it back. So typically, it was like a waterfallish kind of work where, you know, uh, uh, you would develop something and then give it to testing towards the end and you know, testing will go back and say these are the defects and you go back and fix. And you know, every time we had a daily stand-up, this used to be a, a concern that came up with uh, you know, from, from the QA team member saying that I'm typically getting it at the last day and, and so on. So basically, what, what uh, I worked with uh, both the teams to make them understand is that this is ultimately if stories don't get delivered in a, in a sprint, it's the responsibility of both teams. You know, the development cannot say that you know, I've done my job and you know, QA didn't do their job. Uh, QA cannot say that I found some defects and you know, these guys took time to fix it. So that's the reason we were not able to complete the story. I said, you've got to find a way by which you work with each other to see how you can maximize the throughput from the team's perspective. And if it means that you've got to collaborate every day to figure out what gets delivered, what gets tested, what gets completed, uh, that's that's part of both of your responsibility rather than you know looking at as a narrow perspective of your role. It took quite some time for them to understand this, and you know I I, I asked them to change the tone of their update in the standup uh, by by actually saying you know don't say QA and Dev, and you actually have to say who are you pairing up with. I mean, if two or three people are working together on a story, you're actually pairing up and then getting something to be done. So the updates have to, to actually have ownership from both parties for specific stories. So this is how you know, we, we kind of made them understand that, uh, that the roles are complementary, not only complementary, the roles are you know, integral to the success of the project. And it's not as if one role can actually say that I did my job and the other didn't do the job. It's that we did not do the job as a team. So once that appreciation happened, it took some time I think once they started seeing value and I asked them to start working in smaller chunks, delivering smaller chunks, working together. And I think over a period of time, what they found is that, uh, you know, the complaint about Dev and QA slowly started an identical thing. You know, the, the Dev and QA were actually sitting in different floors of, of the building and they were actually, you know, uh, not seeing eye to eye. Right? And, and I said that in Agile, you know, it, unless you guys are you know, co-located, you know, working with each other, literally on a, on a, on a you know, a regular basis, you're not going to be successful. And the test team is completely reluctant because they said that you know they work together, the functional skills are important, and you know they need to talk to their manager regularly, they need to learn from each other. I said that all that can happen, but still what is important for you is delivery on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, your project is more important for you than uh, the fact that you belong to a testing team. Uh, with a lot of reluctance, you know, they did not want to move to you know sitting with the development team, but I actually had to push through this change at the management level and initially you know you, you wouldn't believe that the teams won't see you know won't even talk to each other the dev and the test guys won't talk to each other even though they were actually sitting next to each other but uh, as, as as time you know went by they realized the testers realized that they needed to talk to the developers you know and then you know slowly the the communication through mail kind of disappeared and they actually started talking to each other. then you know after some time they even started going for lunch together which was a you know, welcome change from Initial thing. So I think the, the unfortunate thing is the, the functional mindset that has been built over years, you know, unfortunately needs to disappear if, if we need to succeed in, in today's uh, dynamic environment where you know, teams have to work together much closer. Yeah, that's very interesting, JV, uh, particularly when you said that even the, the words used you know, as pairing and things like that were able to bring that change. Now, I have a question on a different type of change, whether it is needed or how that is needed. You talked about this waterfall to agile transition. Similarly, mm -hmm. when you're working on, let's say, the projects, typically, as we know, with a date and then somebody is doing something mm -hmm. versus, or I don't know if it is versus or from there to a product, since you said you also taught product engineering. Are there any changes in terms of how one approaches it and uh, I whether the skills? 
uh, i missed you a little bit if you can okay yeah i can um, yeah that is very interesting jv the use of uh, even words you know, like when you said pairing you know, how mm-hmm. that promoted collaboration and all that right and the shift from say the waterfall to agile or everybody working together and all that that is one kind of you know a change in oneself mm-hmm. uh, a different probably application of that or a different area where moving from developing software as you know projects to products mm-hmm. you also taught product engineering and all that are there similar changes in one's approaches or mindset that is required and what are some characteristics what is it that you learned that could be useful for our listeners oh a hell of a lot in fact uh, uh, if i if i go back you know my experience with both uh, tata tata unisys and and with novel taught me a lot about you know in in many ways how to develop products and also how not to develop products because you know the first stint with tata unisys we had a you know, financial product and financial services product and i mean you know we were into product development you know so far early into you know the the the, the software and i mean if i look at software industry in the 1980s Uh, not many companies are even actually doing software development from india they were actually you know sending people overseas uh, in that kind of an environment to actually develop a you know, technology based solution for the banking industry and, and as a product solution that itself was a was a, was a big uh, you know, was, was something completely revolutionary those days so being involved with uh, product development in that environment uh, you know, taught me a lot of things about uh, you know value of actually a lot of aspects such as for example configuration management in a product uh, setup right you you need to maintain code base uh, uh, because you are trying to develop this product and actually you use this product in different customer installations sometimes you need to customize them you need to develop different versions of the product and that was the first lesson that i learned that you know how do you, how do you, you know, what do you need to do to ensure you have good solid you know code control and and, and mechanisms for ensuring that your configurations are Uh, have the highest level of integrity and so on and so forth second thing that i learned is you know product development has a lot of angles such as product testing right you know when you're when you're developing a product that's actually getting installed in hundreds of customer sites uh, you, know, you actually need to make sure that the, the quality of the product from all aspects you know whether it's got to do with functionality reliability uh, scalability uh, stress that it has to withstand all of these require you know phenomenal amounts of uh, you know planning design even starting from architecture right uh, i learned that you know if you don't have the right architecture uh, you can't build performance into the product right when you're working for a specific customer uh, you have the flexibility to do something and you know you can do whatever you need to do but when you're trying to work for a product that's getting installed in you know uh, several installations you actually need to think about Uh, how it's going to get used and and what kind of architecture you need for the product right from day one right so i, I think that was a big learning you know aspects such as configuration management product testing uh, and the way that you need to you know architect the product for uh, use at different for, for different kinds of uses all of those are actually big learnings and and that you know increases the effort for developing the same solution substantially i mean i know that uh, Now, learned from uh, you know, reading the mythical man by you know, Fred, frederick brooks that, that you know, developing a product is a is a so substantially larger uh, you know kind of effort than you know, trying to develop a custom solution for a specific uh, you know, uh, situation for a for specific, you know customer for a specific project so i think uh, you know in in, in data analysis we actually developed a product for unisys and 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 there's a huge amount of learning we actually estimated you know the developer actually estimated something like 10 percent weeks I mean, believe it or not 10 percent weeks to develop you know one major part of whatever the product was okay. and then when we actually you know uh, uh, as a management reviewed the estimates and provided the proposal to the customer we actually realized there's a lot of things that was not considered and you know, came up with an estimate of 10 percent years but actually okay. when we delivered the product uh, Ah, so you you are with me. Uh, you know. So when we actually delivered the product, it turned out to be you know twenty twenty five percent, almost double the estimate. And even then, we were actually you know far away from the kind of quality that we ultimately wanted to see in the product. So essentially, I believe that you know when you're developing a product, uh, you need to look at you know many many aspects in terms of how the product is going to get used at different customer sites. What's the kind of usage in terms of you know, volume or Uh, number of uh, users for the product 
and and also look at uh, you know the architecture that actually uh, you know fits in with that requirement and then make sure that you, you have a testing that uh, you know testing strategy and plan and you know approach to ensure that you're able to you know ensure the quality before it it hits the customer so all of these were things that that are new to me and and i think most organizations have you know struggled to develop products so they're moving in from a services kind of setup i've seen that they struggle and uh, even one of the recent customers uh, i said that your your developers need to be trained when they join the company on how to develop products right it's not developing products is not uh, you know writing some code and then you know, pushing it to testing right uh, they need to understand what they need to do to ensure that uh, they get that right in the first place so so it's it's a it, in my opinion i think it's something that uh, you know, that that's a huge change from actually writing a custom software for a specific customer yeah so that uh, you know brings another question to mind the way you describe it uh, definitely there is a lot more attention to detail that is required even from your you know, planning for your products and all that mm -hmm. uh, in today's world when uh, being a startup is very fashionable mm -hmm. and people talk about you know fail early fail fast and all that how does one kind of tailor all these what are considered overheads which you also referred to like techies normally may not want to do these things mm -hmm. in a startup kind of world where the results are expected pretty much on a continual basis or at fairly short bursts i i i personally feel that even in a startup environment uh, you know, we don't necessarily you know look at uh, i'm i'm not i don't even believe in you know i i believe in lean processes if you if you really look at it if you want to do a code review the best way to do a code review is actually you know get a couple of people that you feel comfortable with uh, you know, in terms of review and then you know, make them sit with you to walk through the code and get their feedback and you know make sure that you're able to absorb that feedback and things like that and and i believe that you know you need to actually get a culture of uh, people understanding that working together and and delivering value together is is really what is uh, you know crucial for success uh, if if i go back to one of my experiences of actually working in an open source uh, Uh, software development environment uh, the people who actually were brilliant but did not fit in that kind of a setup primarily because they could not take feedback right uh, and and you know they would not collaborate to get a solution very often they would actually given a problem they'll go back to a corner and and you know work on the solution themselves take their own sweet time to come up with it and and by the by the time they come up with it you know somebody else has actually found the solution working with other people so that's really what happens in the open source world where now you don't have a whole lot of time for you to find a solution whereas if you actually collaborate with each other you will you will find that you are able to come come up with a solution much quicker right and even if if it means that you have to go through a couple of you know trial and error a couple of iterations of actually coming up with a solution that's much better so the, the actual mindset that we need to incorporate in them is you now think about a solution put it in place get it reviewed or you know in an iterative mode with somebody and and that person gives you feedback and actually incorporate that feedback and even if it means that you're finding a few mistakes early it's okay and and that's a you know much better process to work with than sitting back and then you know coming up with a so called ideal design or ideal way of coding and then you know uh, making sure that your code reviews don't throw up any issues at all i mean that you know the in intent is not to say i need to have zero defects in code reviews the intent is to make sure that i you know give it up give it for review as as soon as i could and then even if there is a feedback being able to incorporate the feedback i'm not trying to say produce bad quality code but certainly you know don't need to wait for the so called ideal ideal right you you need to start thinking about uh, how do you actually work together to produce something quicker rather than you know go through a you know, elaborate process where you would actually develop a good very good solution and then you know have minimal you know issues from code review or test you know whatever i mean i, I believe that You know, collaborating, working iteratively, and putting in your best foot forward the first time. I think that's that's probably the best way to work in a product and in startup environment. See, you referred to uh, the book Mythical Man Month. Now uh -huh. you're talking about product engineering and things like that. So similarly, as you mention uh, the open source model or approach, you know, from a more structured way of working. Do you have any recommendations for further reading? Um. 
See, I, I, I think with Agile, there is a, lo- a whole lot of uh, you know, uh, things that are available from uh, some of the you know, leading gurus, you know, whether it's Martin Fowler or Mike Cohn or uh, all of those, those folks, right? Uh, specifically, in terms of architecture, I had uh, you know, uh, one book uh, some time back. I don't remember. Uh, uh, it was soft, uh, Architecture Basics, uh, you know, Architecture Tactics. Uh, there are quite a few like that that you know, I would actually say you know, from agile perspective there is a whole lot. Uh, I'm not sure if there is you know maybe it's some, it, does, it doesn't come to the top of my mind. Maybe you know uh, we, can, we can probably talk about okay. it. When, yeah. yeah, sure. Now it's just like the mythical man month. Whether you know, when one has to think like open source or working in an open source kind of model compared to a small team working. Oh. Whether you had any thoughts on. Uh, yeah, not not at the top of my mind right now, but I, I believe that there are, there are things like, uh, you know, uh, if I remember right, Code Complete. I mean, those days, I'm talking about, you know, when Microsoft released a few books, uh, if I remember right, you know, we had books for, you know, that was written about the Windows NT software development, Code Complete. Quite a few of those I've read where, at least, you no, know, this is quite old. I mean, I'm talking about 15, 20 years back. Some of them I found actually very good because they talked about, you know, the, the real challenges so that, when you actually get into software development, you actually know those are the things to avoid. Hmm. And what I liked about the open source culture is uh, people don't uh, worry about you know, getting negative feedback. I mean, if, if I write a patch for you know, Linux today, uh, at any point in time, you know, maybe 200 to 300 pairs of eyes are looking at that code and giving you feedback uh, on an instant basis. I mean, that's something phenomenal. I don't, you know, you, you wouldn't get that kind of a thing, you know, and I've seen some comments from people which have been very nasty. I mean, you, you, you publish a piece of code and people say it's you know, very, very, very bad thing. I mean, you know, use four letter words on the code uh, when you send, they send code review comments. But, but people have the culture to take it and say, hey, you know, that feedback is actually good so I can learn from it. And so maybe you need to develop a thick skin sometimes. But unless you do, uh, you know, uh, unless you're open for you know, feedback and learning from the process, uh, it's very difficult to learn. And I think that's something that I learned a lot from the open source community, you know, understanding and managing people working in the open source space. Yeah, true. In fact, yeah, one book, since you're talking, as you were mentioning, that came to my mind was, uh, which made a good, a lot of impression on me, is this uh, Cathedral and the Bazaar. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, continuing with our uh, the startup theme, and mm-hmm. uh, all these uh, pressures of creating something new, something that creates an impact and all that. So this is a, a combination of a personal and professional question. Mm-hmm. Uh, as part of the introduction, you said that you are fairly orthodox. Okay. Right. And uh, when we talk about all these solutions, we say you need to be thinking out of the box. Mm-hmm. So how are you able to balance the orthodoxy in personal life and the out of the box in professional life oh, a tough one i mean honestly i think uh, uh, i believe that some of these uh, even if you're orthodox when you're when you're thrown into the deep pool uh, you know you will come up with some ways to manage this uh, it, whether you call it out of the box or you know that you react with uh, you know, how do you deal with challenges uh, because you have to somehow meet meet the challenges i i believe that if you are if you are uh, my my own personal experience has been if if you have been given a challenge uh, and and you know you, you know when you when you when I was young especially you know, uh, somehow I could deal with it because you know uh, one thing you know being uh, being a spiritual person helped me definitely because I had confidence that uh, you know, if if I was if I had faith in something that will help me deal with the situation but uh, I I think given a challenge you know you would. Come with some, come up with something. I believe that more often than not, uh, you know, when you're thrown into the deep pool, you will come up with something, and and that's been my personal experience. So, in fact, one of the the earliest uh, experiences that I had was, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, less than five years into the industry, uh, I had to actually deal with an extremely tough customer, and I was working for you know, Unisys, uh, you know, where we had to actually change, uh, uh, you know, do a customization of a product. That was in a 4 GL you know, uh, you know, language. Uh, customize that product for a financial customer, and and this 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 customer is an extremely tough customer. Uh, 
So my own personal thing, I was actually you know, asked to go and talk to this customer and uh, get a sign off from the customer for requirements uh, for the customization. And you know, the, the situation was, I did not know, uh, you know ABC of, no, I did not even know the fourth GL, so I had to learn the fourth GL first. Second, this was a financial services space and I had, I had actually worked in the distribution and manufacturing side. So I did not know a lot about the financial side. So I needed to learn that. Third, this was a product, so I needed to learn the product. Fourth, I had to you know, actually deal with the customer and you know, uh, talk his language. Now with all of these, all that I was given was about three days at another customer site to go and see another installation to understand the product, the application, the, you know, the technology, the, you know, the source code, everything, and then go and you know, use that learning in, the, in this customer who was an extremely tough customer for Burroughs. To, to collect requirements and get a sign off from you in about you know, two, two and a half months. And this is the you know, chief financial officer or the you know, financial controller of the company. Very experienced person. And I was just four or five years experience. So, I mean, I did not even you know, know how I was going to respond, but once the challenge is out, you will actually go out of the way to make sure that you, you want to succeed at all costs. So, I learned a lot of things. You know, how to do analysis, how to capture requirements, you know, new techniques to actually do that. And you know, if I look back, that was one of the first projects in, you know, in, in Tata Unisys Startup Bros, where we actually you know, delivered a, a comprehensive requirement specification document signed off with a customer and, and used that for developing a turnkey solution subsequently. So I, I, I don't know whether you know, there is any magic solution there, but whether you're orthodox or not, if I believe that if you are thrown into the deep pool, you will somehow you know, learn to swim and, and come across. If you have the confidence and faith, you'll probably do that. And I think uh, the fact that you know, I had a fairly good you know, educational background and, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, a decent kind of experience with that you know, helped me pull through that situation, I guess. Yeah, thanks, JV. I'm sure our listeners will appreciate that. Now, being at peace with yourself and having faith in yourself as well will let you see through any situation. Yeah, I, I believe so. And I don't know that there is any, any other magic bullet or... I mean, thinking out of the box, obviously, I, I can be much better. I, I know that I'm not necessarily the most creative person in the world. But certainly, I believe that you know, finding a solution to the problem that you have is, is, is probably what you need to do. And if you have to take somebody's help, so be it. I mean, they, they, you don't have egos. Make sure that learning is the, the most important thing. And, and you know, solving a problem for the customer gives you satisfaction. And if you're able to get uh, all of these together, somehow you'd swim and, and make sure that you're successful. Um, considering the time, the last question I have for you is uh, your transition from mechanical engineering to software. Now, mm -hmm. when you look back, you know, we do talk about software also as software engineering, and then there are software factories as the dream way of developing software and all that. So do you think we are anywhere close to software development being an engineering kind of discipline or being able to develop software in factories? I, I don't know whether maybe, you know, maybe during the late 80s, you know, there was a lot of talk about software factories. I was one of the people who was involved in software tool uh, development at Tata Unisys and you know, setting up the tools function. Uh, that time, the Toshiba software factory was given as you know, one of the big, big uh, you know, role models for, for getting into the software factory mode and so on. Today, I don't believe that, uh, you know, it, the same same uh, thing is true. I mean, there's a the way the software has been developed over the last uh, several years. I think a lot of things have changed, and we are not into the factory mode. I agree, but I still believe that uh, uh, collaborative development has actually taken off in a in such a big way. Uh, there, there's a good combination of creativity and and collaboration that's at work today, and that's not necessarily a typical. You know, I wouldn't say it's a typical factory situation. So. To me, I don't think uh, that that uh, uh, ideology or that that uh, thing is, is true today. I mean, the way I would look at software development is how do you actually get people to, uh, you know, uh, not only you know recruit smart people, but actually get, help people understand that you know, working with each other and, and learning from each other is, is the best way to do it, and and, and that will actually drive uh, you know, people to leverage each other for creativity and, and, and collaboration to produce the best thing. So I, I don't, I, I'm not uh, 
uh, a strong believer of the software factory thing today. I mean, that, that used to be 20, 25 years ago. No, no longer. I mean, I, I wouldn't think that's as important today as uh, you know, getting people to work together and, and you know, collaborating to find the solution for the customer. So there is still some hope that you know, software will continue to be a team sport and it is not going to be replaced by robots. I don't think so. I still I still believe that for the next you know, at least 15, 20, 25 years, we'll still need uh, humans actually working together to produce uh, with the best software. I mean, that, that's probably still going to be the, the way that it's going to be for the next, at least the foreseeable future. Yeah, you will find that uh, more more uh, as the world becomes uh, smarter and smarter and you know technology takes over uh, but but still you you need to you know have people to build that technology and i still believe that uh, you know you need to get smart people working together in in a collaborative way to build that smart technology and and i think that the people element will will continue to be a key thing you know as we move forward thanks jv uh, i know that one topic or theme that is very close to your heart we've not even touched upon maybe in our next conversation which is bridge and yeah bridge in and fact I, I, yeah. I did i did when i introduced myself we didn't talk about it but uh, yeah. yeah i mean bridge and carnatic music are two things that i enjoy but uh, you know, it's, it's not been something that i've had too much time for but hopefully somewhere in the future i would i would be able to spend more time on that yeah i think when we talk next um, i would definitely like to you know pick your brain on some of those things Thanks, so thanks, thanks a lot, JV, uh, for uh, sharing all these. If uh, whatever questions our listeners have, we'll uh, pass them on to you, and I'm sure you'll be able to respond to them. Thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure, and you know, look forward to talking to you again. If you like the show and would like to share your experiences with the community or know someone else who might want to do that, please get in touch with us at podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com. That is podcast at pm-powerconsulting.com.